Hello and welcome to this first video lecture on anatomy and function of the kidneys. This is the first in a series of lectures created by myself, Eleanor Gartside, and my colleague Robert Patton for the undergraduate section of the Renal Med website. Hello, my name is Eleanor and I'm going to be taking you through a brief introduction to the anatomy and function of the kidneys. So we'll briefly cover the surface anatomy and position of the kidneys, the gross and microscopic anatomy, the blood supply, and finally we'll go on to some functions. The kidneys are retroperitoneal organs, so they sit in the retroperitoneal space and are only covered by your peritoneum anteriorly. They're around 10 to 12 centimetres long, roughly the size of your fist, and weigh 115 to 170 grams each. They usually lie over the transverse processes of T12 to L3, and the right is slightly lower than the left as the liver pushes it down. Approximately one in a thousand people will be born with only one kidney. They're surrounded by layers of fat which serve to protect them from injury, and further protection is offered by the erector spinae muscle and the posterior abdominal walls muscle, which lie posterior to the kidney. This protection is quite sufficient as the kidneys are only injured in approximately 10% of all blunt abdominal traumas. Here you can see a coronal section of a kidney. It's covered by a tough fibrous capsule called the renal capsule. As you can see, it's made up of an outer cortex, which is the pale area, and an inner medulla, the darker area. The cortex contains most of the nephrons, which we'll see in the next slide, and on average, it's around one centimetre thick. In chronic kidney disease, the cortex may thin, and imaging can provide a good marker for long-term damage. The medulla is organised into the renal pyramids and these are surrounded by projections of the cortex called the renal columns. As you can see, the tips of the renal pyramids drain into what we call the renal papilla. As urine is produced, it drains into the papilla, then into what we call the minor calyx, then into the major calyx, and then into the renal pelvis. The renal pelvis then becomes the ureter as it leaves the kidney and transports the urine to the bladder. On the medial margin is the hilus, which is where blood vessels and the ureter enter and leave the kidney. The blood supply to the kidney is via the renal artery, which branches directly off the aorta and carries 20 to 25 percent of the total cardiac output. The kidneys are drained by the renal veins, which drain directly into that inferior vena cava, although the left is slightly longer than the right as it has to cross the midline to reach the inferior vena cava. Moving on to the microanatomy of the kidney, the functional unit is called the nephron, and each kidney contains around one million. They are approximately two to five millimetres long and can be divided into two types. 85% of the nephrons are cortical nephrons, which you can see on the right here. This means that the majority lie in the outer cortex and have a short loop going into the medulla. The remaining 15% are juxtamedullary nephrons, which sit in the inner third of the cortex and have a long loop that goes into the medulla. After the age of around 35, there is a 1% loss in function each year as a result of nephron loss with ageing. Each nephron consists of three parts, the renal corpuscle, a tubular component and a vascular component. On this diagram, you can see the tubular component quite well. It's made up of the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and the uh, distal convoluted tubule, which then drains into the collecting ducts. The tubular component is important for concentrating urine and regulating electrolytes, but we'll talk about this in a later slide. The renal corpuscle is critical to the function of the kidney. It's made up of the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule, the capsular space, a network of capillaries, and mesangial cells. Considering the blood flow first, blood travels in via an afferent arteriole and passes into the glomerulus, which is like a ball of capillaries. You can see the capillaries are covered with cells called podocytes, which form the visceral epithelium. It's surrounded by a capsule called the Bowman's capsule, and the gaps between the capillaries in the glomerulus are filled with mesangium, which is made up of mesangial cells and matrix. The mesangium helps uh, regulate glomerular filtration by contracting, which reduces the filtration surface area. And it also acts as a scaffolding to provide structural support for the capillary loops of the glomerulus. The corpuscle acts like a sieve, 
which filters based on size and charge. Its primary function is to produce an ultrafiltrate of the plasma in the Bowman's capsule as the blood passes through the capillaries. This ultrafiltrate then passes into the proximal convoluted tubule and will eventually become urine. Once the blood has been filtered in the corpuscle, it leaves via the efferent arteriole. The proximal tubule has two segments. The first is convoluted and the second is straight as it passes down towards the medulla where it becomes the loop of Henle. The convoluted part is made up of columnar and cuboidal cells and has a brush border of millions of microvilli and also contains many mitochondria. This creates a large surface area and the energy required to carry out the primary function of reabsorption. The straight part, which can also be regarded as the beginning of the loop of Henle, is similar but has a less dense brush border, fewer mitochondria and is generally more flattened. The loop of Henle itself has squamous epithelium, but the function of the descending and ascending limbs is very different. The descending limb is permeable to water but impermeable to sodium, while the ascending limb is impermeable to water but highly permeable to sodium and some urea. This creates a countercurrent mechanism and allows the formation of a hypertonic interstitial fluid in the medulla, but this will be discussed in much more detail in a later presentation. When the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle enters the cortex, it passes very close to the Bowman's capsule and comes into contact with the afferent and efferent arterioles, forming the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Specialised cells in the distal tubule are called macular denser cells, and they respond to the composition of the fluid in the lumen. Specialised cells in the afferent arteriole are called granular cells and release renin when there is a decrease in sodium detected. In the space between the tubule and the two arterioles is the extraglomerular mesangial cells. Similar to the mesangium in the glomerulus, they are able to contract. And the juxtaglomerular apparatus as a whole is important in electrolyte transport and tubular glomerular feedback. The cortical thick ascending limb and distal tubule are similar to the proximal tubule in that they have columnar and cuboidal epithelium, but there's no brush border. They do still have mitochondria, which is important for active transport. This part of the nephron is important for the hormonal control of calcium levels. The collecting duct consists of two cell types, principal cells which have sodium-potassium ATPase activity on the basal membrane and are important in potassium secretion, while the intercalated cells have high carbonic anhydrase activity and are therefore important in acid-base balance. Here you can see the vascular component of the nephron. The blood supply to the nephron is unique. As can be seen in the diagram, the afferent vessel to the glomerulus is branched off the renal artery. After filtration occurs, the efferent vessel leaves as an arteriole rather than a venule. This anatomy is important for the function of the countercurrent mechanism, as will be described in a subsequent lecture. The capillaries are very closely associated with the nephron, so there's a large surface area available for the exchange of water, ions and waste products. These loops of vessels, called the vasorecta, are very specialised capillaries for the juxtamedullary nephrons, carrying nutrient and oxygen-rich blood for the tissues of the kidneys in the opposite direction to the filtrate, thus enabling the formation of the hyperosmotic filtrate. If you don't understand this now, don't worry, we'll cover this complicated process in a later lecture. Now I'm going to introduce you to the functions of the kidney. Many people think their main purpose is just to produce urine, but in fact they have a number of other vital homeostatic functions. The first is salt and water homeostasis, which is achieved by the action of antidiuretic hormone and the concentration of urine. The second is that the kidney also has a role in acid-base balance by reabsorbing bicarbonate and excreting hydrogen ions. They are also endocrine organs. For example, they secrete erythropoietin, the hormone involved in red blood cell production. Actions of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system on the kidney help to regulate blood pressure. The regulation of salt and water also contributes to the blood pressure regulation by the kidney. They do excrete waste products, the most important being urea and ammonium. 
And finally, the kidneys have some metabolic functions as well. For example, they activate vitamin D, which plays an important role in calcium homeostasis. Hopefully, you now have a basic understanding of renal anatomy and function. In the next presentation, we will go into further detail about the functions of the kidney, how they result in symptoms, and clinical presentations when something goes wrong. Thank you for watching. If you want further information in the meantime, please visit www.renalmed.co.uk.